The creatures were shifting around the battlefield at a rapid pace, maneuvering us like we were mere pawns in a lethal game of chess. I couldn't understand why our weapons had no effect. They had been reinforced by the finest mages and magics in the kingdom. It wasn't until one of the men, who had just been disarmed, threw a punch. His last act of defiance against the monster looming over him. To our surprise, the creature recoiled from the blow. What was I not seeing here? I had to figure it out before it was too late. Welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we go back and dig up old creatures from past editions of Dungeons & Dragons and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition D&D campaign. I'm your host Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we are kind of doing a bit of a throwback to the Marut. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you'll remember the episode I did on Inevitables like around this time last year, where I talked about Maruts who were guardians of the galaxy, as it were, or the multiverse. I think that name's already taken. But nonetheless, this creature I'm about to show you is the result of a Marut who has been corrupted by whatever evil forces are happening in the background of your game. The Nullifier, which can be found in the 4th edition book The Plane Above, can be found in the section in that book about abominations. And as that category would suggest, these creatures are indeed abominations. These guys act as living voids, consuming all magical and arcane energy around them and what they come into contact with. They are native to the plane Carceri, which is a place that houses the Red Prison, which you may or may not be familiar with, but essentially it's a prison plane that all of the gods use as literally just that, a prison but for beings that are so powerful they wouldn't be able to be held in a normal prison. So inside of Carceri you'll find things like fallen angels or demons who have gone against their master's orders, or in some cases Maruts who ended up being twisted by the foul magic within this prison world. There's a lot of plot stuff going on with their origin that we'll get into a bit later in the video, but I do think these guys have a lot to offer both in and out of combat and that's what we're going to show you today. But first things first, put away that spellbook and get ready to start punching stuff because it's time for... The Nullifier is deceptively simple in its form. No weapons, no armor, just a large, monstrous looking humanoid with a giant void gaping in its belly. The purpose of that void is not simply just to look like a terrifying version of a Teletubby. What it does is draw in all magical energy they come in contact with, as I previously mentioned, but from a mechanical standpoint that actually gives them quite a few powerful abilities. The first of which is it grants this creature immunity to attacks made with magical weapons. Now normally when you get to this level of play, around level 10 to 15, when you might actually be fighting one of these things, you're going to have magical weapons and almost everything is immune to damage from non-magical weapons. These guys kind of turn that on their head as they are able to absorb the magical energy from any blows laid against them and use it to reflect the blow back against the person attacking them with a sword or whatever it is. This isn't actually going to cause any damage to anyone who makes an attack against them, but their attacks will seem to just bounce off. So, in order to actually do damage to these guys with physical weapons, you have to use mundane weapons. Non-enchanted greatswords, regular arrows, the stuff that you haven't thought about since level 3 or 4. Worst comes to worst, you might have to take off those enchanted gauntlets and start throwing punches. This is something that's largely up to the DM in how you might describe the way these attacks are kind of glancing off. This is an ability that's going to rely heavily on your DMing abilities to describe exactly what's going on. Because if your players are just hitting this thing with their weapons and not doing any damage, they might get a little bit confused. But if you're describing the weapons as literally bouncing off and like these little charges of magical energy kind of dispersing from the weapon onto them and then outwards, they might start to get the idea. It's especially useful if you have a monk in your party who's going to go up and start punching it anyways, because if only the monk's able to do damage and no one else can, maybe they'll be able to put two and two together. And when it comes to spells, this guy can still be affected by magical spells, he just simply has magic resistance like most golems do. And if you're not familiar with what that does, it essentially gives them advantage on saves against magical effects. But that said though, these guys are not constructs or golems of any kind, they are fiends. Which ties into their one vulnerability, which is radiant damage. So, the only way you're going to be able to truly break through these guys' defenses is if you have a weapon that is dealing radiant damage, or you're casting spells that deal radiant damage. But you will have to be very careful with what spells you are casting, because this creature also has another ability provided by this void inside of its body, called Dispelling Presence. Essentially, whenever this creature walks into or enters an area that is being affected by some kind of magical effect, whether it be some kind of aura, or an ongoing spell like Moonbeam, or Spirit Guardians, whatever it is, if that spell is level 6 or lower, it is immediately dissipated. So this creature essentially has the ability to turn off any spells of level 6 or lower that are cast at a constant rate around it. 
Now, of course, any regular spell is going to happen in an instant, so it's not going to be able to counterspell anything that's level 6 or lower. But if it's a continuous effect that is affecting an area, like maybe Consecration is a good example of that, it's going to just essentially turn it off. It's a very useful ability for a creature such as this that doesn't actually cast spells, but just because they don't cast spells doesn't mean they don't have any interesting abilities. For example, the way these guys move around, they can move at 40 feet, but they also have a hover speed of 20, so they can float just above the ground. But on top of that, they can also use their movement action to teleport up to 20 feet away. So they're going to be incredibly hard to pin down and even more difficult to capture as they're zipping around the battlefield, basically appearing and disappearing whenever they need to be. And as for attacks, they can do one thing really, really well, and that is throw punches. Two of them per turn to be exact. However, it's not doing just simple slam attacks. It has four different types of punches it can deliver that all do different things and cause different types of damage, which it's going to choose from depending on what the situation is. Its first punch is called Linked Fist. This attack slams the target for a good amount of bludgeoning damage and a small amount of necrotic damage. That's pretty run of the mill, but after the attack is over, it is then able to teleport one of its allies within 30 feet into a 5 foot space adjacent to the target that it's punching. So Nullifier can hit somebody and the other Nullifier who's 30 feet away is now suddenly on the opposite side of you and that's cornering you against this first creature. If you are using flanking rules, this can be especially brutal. Its second attack is called Siphon Fist and does the exact same amount of damage, however its secondary effect is a little different. Rather than teleporting one of its allies closer, this attack drains any temporary hit points that creature has down to zero, and it also removes any enchantments that were placed upon that creature. So if it notices your paladin is taking an especially high amount of damage, it doesn't seem to be bothered too much by it. If it delivers a nullifying punch like this, it's able to reduce their temporary hit points down to nothing, and maybe take off that heroism or whatever buff they had applied to themselves to make them a little weaker. Its third option is called Draining Fist, and this one does a little bit less damage. However, the payoff is worth it. The target has to make a save, and if they fail that save, they suffer a level of exhaustion. They're fatigued. In addition to this, they're also afflicted with a condition called Spirit Drain that causes them to take 1d10 necrotic damage at the beginning of every turn for the next minute. It's kind of like a spiritual poison in a way. Now this ability is pretty good in its own right, especially because causing someone to be fatigued even at just one level is going to make them roll all of their saves with disadvantage, which is going to make all of the other attacks do a little bit more damage and make it more difficult for players to save against certain effects. However, it plays well as a one-two punch with this next ability which is called Amplifying Fist. This does the same amount of damage as those first two punches, except the values are switched for what kind of damage it does. So it does a lot less bludgeoning damage, but it does a lot more necrotic damage. And once it delivers one of these punches, it kind of surges all of the necrotic energy in the 15 foot area around it, and any creature that's within 15 feet that is taking some kind of continuous damage, such as poison or spirit drain damage, immediately takes one instance of that damage. So if it has two or three creatures within that 15 foot radius that are all suffering from spirit drain and it delivers one of these punches, all of those creatures immediately take 1d10 damage, and depending on what kind of allies you're pairing these creatures with, there could be poison damage or bleeding damage or any other kind of damage that's ongoing also stacking on top of this, which makes things very dangerous. These four attacks alone allow for an insane amount of tactical control and awareness about the battlefield. Being able to teleport themselves around while negating the bonuses of their enemies and also teleporting their allies in closer and more advantageous positions is all fantastic for them. These guys are great if you want to play out a very tactically challenging encounter, especially if you use a grid. And as I briefly mentioned, they get two of these punches per turn, so there's a lot of tactical potential here. And their final ability, the one thing they can do that isn't a punch, plays up to this angle even more. Cosmic Rip is their one ability that doesn't involve punching anything, and they simply use this void inside them to draw in all the astral energy that's within 15 feet. Any targets within that area take a pretty substantial amount of psychic damage, of course they can make a save to try to cut that number in half, but nonetheless they're still going to take a bit of psychic damage at the very least, and they are also teleported up to 30 feet in any direction away from the nullifier that the nullifier gets to choose. So not only are they able to teleport themselves and bring their allies closer, they're also able to reposition their enemies and put them in positions where they're not going to want to be. Now this ability is on a recharge of 6, meaning they won't be able to abuse it and use it too too often, but it can allow for some extremely powerful setups if done right. They could even use this to purposefully hit some of their allies within the blast, which would cause them some psychic damage, 
but it would also allow them to reposition their allies so that on their next turn they could have potentially been teleported two or three times before they even got to move themselves. Essentially, it's extra movement at the cost of HP, which is a great option to have if you absolutely need it. The only limit on how powerful these guys really are in combat is dependent on how efficiently you want to play them as the Dungeon Master. And I think that's a great position to be in because it allows them to be used in all different kinds of games. If you run a game that's extremely combat heavy and your players love engaging with complex monsters and using tactics and really being pushed to try to strategize every single turn, you can use them that way and these guys will be a great and engaging encounter for a group like that. However, if your group's a little bit more casual and they just want to run through and of course enjoy combat and be challenged but not necessarily overthink every turn, you can also use them like that, you just don't have to overthink every turn yourself. It's totally possible for these guys to be useful monsters even if you're not playing them optimally. And speaking of how we want to actually play these monsters, let's take a closer look at that with some... So as the lord of these creatures would suggest, they were corrupted after trying to break out of the Red Prison. Originally they were a group of Maruts who apparently turned to mercenaries and were thus cast into the prison for going against their calling and pretty much the only reason they were created. So if you have an adventure planned that takes place in a celestial prison or literally in the Red Prison, these guys would make great prison inmate denizens for that kind of a dungeon or adventure. Maybe your players have actually been sentenced to this prison for some crime they committed against a god or a demon or whoever, because the Red Prison isn't used just by the good gods like Paylor or whoever else, it's a prison that is used by all of the immortals and they kind of have an agreement with each other not to mess with each other's prisoners. They just throw them in there and forget about them. So if your players have found them in a position such as that, or maybe they're trying to break into the Red Prison to get someone out, whatever the case is, these guys can make great monsters to run into. Or if your players aren't 100% on the up and up, maybe they're interesting NPCs to interact with. That is ultimately up to you. If you find that kind of stuff interesting though, definitely check out The Plane Above, the book I mentioned before. It has a whole section about the prison plane of Sarceri, which holds the Red Prison, and all kinds of great adventure hooks in there, so couldn't recommend that one enough. But moving on, as fiends, they can also make great summons for your big bad evil guy who happens to be a warlock or some kind of arcane wizard that is summoning forth fiends to assist him in whatever he's trying to do. I mean, at worst, these guys are simply another fiend that you can add to your monster manual for if you ever need a high level demon or whatever. It's also possible maybe a group of these guys actually did manage to break out of the Red Prison and they're now roaming the astral plane as the mercenaries they once were as Maroots. So they're just kind of a group of free agents out there pillaging or doing whatever it is that they want. Which again, could make for an interesting encounter if you're having kind of a plane hopping campaign or maybe your players are on a Gith Yankee vessel traveling through the astral plane and they get attacked and raided by a group of nullifiers. Maybe just one nullifier who happened to end up as part of this gang or whatever the situation is. You could also ignore the fiend aspect of this creature and the whole bit of lore about them being Maruts changed to devils. Just retype them as a construct. Maybe they're simply golems in your world. Under that guise, that allows you to repurpose these creatures for all kinds of different things. Maybe a character in your game isn't a warlock, but he's some kind of artist artificer and he has golems, so this is another golem that you can add to your repertoire. And it's not in the monster manual because no one's created one of these before. He was the first one to successfully create a nullifier. And honestly, other than that, you don't have to do much more tweaking because they already have that anti-magic aspect to them, which all the golems already have. Maybe you have a brutal king or queen who's this tyrannical overlord that has outlawed magic entirely within their kingdom, and they have nullifiers that are kind of created and serve as part of the city guard. So groups of guards go around with one nullifier and they use the nullifier to destroy any magic that they find. Plus it helps that they look fairly intimidating so no one's going to try to start anything when a nullifier is around. It would also make sense for a creature like this to be used as essentially a weapon of war against someone who is using a lot of magic. So if you have some kind of spellcaster who is enchanting their army's weapons or just using a lot of magical defenses, a nullifier would be a perfect response to that. In a situation like that, if it's a golem and not a straight up devil, you could even rule that one of these creatures is being used for good. It could even be used as a tool that has been provided to the party by whatever NPCs they're aligned with to try to take down the evil lich. Maybe it can break through their magical force field around their castle, so they bring this nullifier with them to break through the magical defenses and then the party can go in and do what they need to do. Ultimately, anywhere that there's magic heavily involved, you could possibly use a nullifier and think about how the opposition to that side might use it to overcome whatever magic is being cast. 
ultimately, I do think these guys are really cool, and they just provide really interesting opportunities for combat, especially if you are using a grid like I mentioned. I mean, you could do a lot of their maneuvering and stuff like that in the theater of the mind, and if that's your thing, absolutely go for it. But on a grid, it definitely provides a lot more clarity, and like many other 4th edition creatures, you kind of get that feeling that they were designed with the grid in mind. But no matter what you choose to do, I think these creatures can make a great addition to almost any world, and I hope you have a chance to use them in your game at some point in the future. If you already have used one of these in your game, or maybe you've had one used against you, uh, please take a second and tell me about it in the comments below. I always love hearing your guys' stories, and I find them super interesting. Plus, I've definitely ripped off one or two of them in the past and used them in my game, so no ulterior motives here. And of course, if you actually do want to use one of these in one of your games, or you're just curious to take a look, you can find the stat block for this guy in the description below. There's a link to a Google document that lays out everything you need to run this monster in your game. And if you are one of my lovely patrons, in the description below, you can also find the link to my Patreon page where you will find the full monster manual style stat block for this creature posted there. And of course, while you're down in the description, you can see all of our social media stuff, uh, Twitter, best way to get a hold of me for sure, uh, Discord if you want to chat with the community, or also get a hold of me over there, I'm usually kind of lurking on there. And of course, Reddit, Facebook, all that good stuff. And the other thing that's below the video is the subscribe button, so if you're not already subscribed and you like what I do here, you want to support the channel, you want to see more videos, please do so, that tells me that you are actually interested in what I'm doing. Anyways, I want to thank you guys so much for watching, I do really appreciate it, and I will see you in the next video. Till then.